Video Lecture 10C, Molecular Geometry and Polarity. In the previous chapter, we discussed how bonds can be polar. A bond between two atoms can be polar if their, electro if their electronegativities are very different. This will result in an unequal sharing of electrons and the electron density will be higher around the atom that is more electronegative. When we put bonds together to form larger molecules, the entire molecule can end up being polar. This is due to a reduction in the symmetry of the charge distribution. This means that there will be more electron density around one part of the molecule than another. An entire molecule may be polar if it contains at least one polar bond and somehow has a reduction in the charge symmetry. This can happen in two ways. The first is the molecular geometry can end up reducing the charge symmetry. We can illustrate this by looking at two triatomic molecules. The first is carbon dioxide. We know from the previous lecture that carbon dioxide is a linear molecule. If we examine the electronegativities of carbon and oxygen, we find that the carbon-oxygen bond is polar. However, carbon dioxide itself is, is a nonpolar molecule. We can see this by looking at the electrostatic potential map, which, has, which is shown superimposed on the ball stick model of CO2. Remember that the blue portions of the electrostatic potential map represent an area of the molecule that has less electron density. The red portions of the, of the electrostatic potential map represent parts of the molecule that has a lot of electron density, while the green areas of the map represent an area, an areas of the molecule with intermediate electron density. Note that the electrostatic potential map is, a, is symmetric. Although the carbon-oxygen bonds are polar, due to the linear geometry of, of the molecule, the, the density is equal on both sides of the molecule. Therefore, carbon dioxide is not polar. However, sulfur dioxide is polar. This is mainly due to the fact that the sulfur dioxide is a bent molecule. If we look at the electrostatic potential map, we notice that one end of the molecule towards the sulfur, which is less electronegative to the, than the oxygens, is blue, while this, the map appears to be more red towards the oxygen. This asymmetry in the charge distribution in the molecule Makes, the, makes sulfur dioxide a polar molecule. Another way to reduce the charge symmetry is to place is, is the presence of different types of bonds. Carbon tetrachloride is a common organic solvent. If we look at carbon tetrachloride, we see that it's a tetrahedral molecule. We can also examine the carbon chlorine bond, and we find that it is polar, with chlorine being much more electronegative than carbon. Although this molecule has polar bonds, again it is not polar due, due mainly to the high symmetry of a tetrahedral molecule. However, if we replace one of the carbon, carbon chlorine bonds with a carbon hydrogen bond, to make chloroform, CHCl3, we find that the polarity changes. Chloroform is a polar molecule. We've broken the charge symmetry by adding a different type of bond. Notice that one area of the molecule closest to the hydrogen is blue, while the other areas are green. This indicates an asymmetry in 
in the charge distribution. We can also quantify the polarity of a, of a bond or a molecule using the dipole moment. The dipole moment is a quantity that depends on the, char the distribution of charge and the distance. And distance. In chemistry, when we look at a molecule, this is going to depend on the electronegativities of the atoms and the bond distance. The SI unit for dipole moment is the, is the Debye. Dipole moments are vector quantities. These are quantities that have both a magnitude and a direction. We often represent vector quantities using arrows. We can illustrate this by looking at the water molecule, which is pictured to the right. Usually we represent dipole moment arrows with an arrow that is pointing towards the more electronegative atom. We've done this on the rightmost oxygen-hydrogen bond. Note that the arrow points towards oxygen since it's more electronegative than hydrogen. Dipole moment arrows are often, are often, often have a little plus sign on the tail. The plus sign is on the side with the less electronegative atom, in this case hydrogen. We can draw two dipole moment arrows, one for each carbon or oxygen hydrogen bond. Both arrows will point towards oxygen. Vector quantities such as dipole moment may be added up to describe an overall dipole moment for a molecule. If we add up the vector quantities, the, the dipole moment arrows for water, we find that the overall dipole moment is pointing towards the oxygen. This makes sense since oxygen is more electronegative than hydrogen. So we would predict that more electron density will be around the oxygen atom than around the hydrogen atoms. A polar molecule will have a permanent non-zero dipole moment due to the differing electronegativities of the atoms and the reduction in charge symmetry. Water is a very polar molecule. It has a dipole moment of about 1.85 Debye. Now we will practice predicting whether or not a molecule is polar. To do this, we must consider the geometry of the molecule as well as the electronegativities of the atoms contained in the molecule. Our first example is we will compare carbon disulfide with CSO. The first thing we should do is assign a molecular geometry to each molecule. We start off by drawing a Lewis structure of each molecule. Note the similarity of these Lewis structures to the, Lewis, to the structure of carbon dioxide. If we look at each carbon atom, we see that there are two sigma bonds surrounding it. This will give us linear geometries for both molecules. Now let's consider the polarity of the bonds. Both the carbon sulfur and the carbon oxygen bonds are predicted to be polar. We can illustrate this by drawing our dipole moment arrows. Carbon disulfide, just like carbon dioxide, will be a nonpolar molecule. Although the carbon sulfur bond is polar, the orientation of the dipole moment arrows will will add up, will end up adding up to be, give a non-zero dipole moment. However, if we look at the CSO molecule, we find that the dipole moment arrows are not the same length. This is because a carbon oxygen bond will be much more polar than a carbon sulfur bond. When we add up the dipole moment arrows, we get an overall dipole moment plate pointing towards the oxygen end of the molecule. Therefore, CSO is a polar molecule.
The reason why CSO is a polar molecule is mainly due to the presence of a different type of bond, since both molecules have the same molecular geometry. Our next example is we will predict whether or not sulfur tetrachloride or silicon tetrachloride is polar. We first need Lewis structures for both molecules. Here's the Lewis structure for sulfur tetrachloride. Note that around the sulfur atom, there are four sigma bonds and one lone pair. This corresponds to a C cell geometry. Here's the Lewis structure for silicon tetrachloride. Note that there are four sigma bonds around the silicon atom. This will give us a tetrahedral geometry. Note that the pictures use dashed, dot, dashed wedge notation. Remember that the dashed lines represent bonds that are going behind the plane of the screen while the wedge lines represent bonds that are coming out of the plane of the screen. Now that we've described the geometry of each molecule, let's determine if there will be polar or nonpolar. The sulfur chlorine bond should be a polar bond. If we draw dipole moment arrows for each bond, they'll point towards the chlorine atom, which is more electronegative than sulfur. The two vertical sulfur chlorine bond dipoles will cancel one another out. However, the two bond dipoles that are, that are in the horizontal direction won't cancel out. This will give an overall dipole moment that points towards the chlorines in the horizontal direction. Therefore, we can predict that sulfur tetrachloride will be polar. The silicon chlorine bond is also a polar bond, and we can draw dipole moment arrows that point towards the chlorine. However, due to the high symmetry of the, of the tetrahedral molecule, silicon tetrachloride will be a nonpolar molecule. In this case, sulfur tetrachloride is polar due to the reduction of charge symmetry. This is mainly due to the fact the sulfur has a lone pair on it. This distorts the tetrahedral geometry and causes the molecule to be polar.